Welcome to English 4E. This is class 30, and today we are working on the assignment of Unit 3, Culminating Activity. Today is Tuesday, April 9th, 2024, and I am Jill Percy. Here is, as always, our contact information. Oh, PowerPoint's always a little bit slow when we get started. My Facebook and my YouTube are the same, capital G, capital P, E, R, C, Y, space, capital W, A, H, S, A. If you need to ask me a question about an assignment, my email is jillian.percy at nnecschools.org. If you want to call and talk to me while I'm on air, 1-800-465-7144. If you want to call and talk to me when I'm off air, 1-800-667-3703. And my extension is 2211. Any assignments you need to send in, please send to studentwork at nnec.on.ca. Always include your name, the course name, the assignment number and name, and if there's a rough copy and a good copy, please label them both and try to send them at the same time because they have different marking schemes and often different levels of marks. Okay, so today we are looking at a whole bunch of things. It's kind of a mishmash culminating assignment. We're looking at how to conduct an analysis of business writing using the PayBach formula format, which I will explain in a little bit. Apply this understanding by doing an analysis of a business letter and an analysis of a business memo. Write and send the teacher, me, an email message, and then call and leave a voicemail message for the teacher. And again, that's part of the assignment. I didn't create this, by the way. I'm just kind of letting you know what happens. Okay, so the first part of this is kind of just going over uh, verbal versus nonverbal communication. In the workplace and elsewhere, messages are both sent and received among people in a structured way, even though we are not consciously thinking about it. Furthermore, effective communication happens only when messages sent are received and understood. Understanding of a message shared and feedback provided by the receiver of some kind are absolutely necessary to ensure that communication is effective. In other words, that it works, right? Effective communication then depends on a sender and a receiver being aware at least that there has to be an understanding of messages, information, ideas, and feelings shared. Verbal communication, we often think of that as oral communication, but actually verbal communication has anything to do with words, okay? Any type of communication between or among people that makes use of words, whether it's written or spoken is considered verbal communication. That's why like on the SATs, they'll have like, uh, here's the verbal section. That's what they mean. It isn't that you're talking, it's that it's about words compared to say math. Words can be expressed through writing as well as through speech. Although speaking is a form of verbal communication, since words form the basis of messages, it is more specifically known as oral communication. And I know in kind of normal everyday language, we often use oral and verbal as synonyms of each other, but in sort of official academia, they're not necessarily considered to be synonyms. So forms of verbal communication other than oral communication, in other words, speaking, include letters, memos, emails, faxes, reports, books, magazines, and newspapers. Other than speech, verbal communication results from anything a person is able to read. Okay, while people are able to see the obvious importance and necessity of words to communicate, it may be less obvious that we also communicate non-verbally. Non-verbal communication refers to any communication which does not make use of words either written or spoken. So forms of nonverbal communication include eye contact, facial expressions like smiles or frowns, gestures, nodding, holding a hand up like you don't want to talk to somebody, other kind of gestures like that, posture, sitting up straight, sitting with your hands folded, leaning back with your arms crossed, um, your head down on your desk, all those kind of posture things also communicate um, information about how you're feeling or how ready you are to listen. And... Uh, sign language. Um, these forms are more commonly known as body language, and they certainly add a great deal of meaning to oral communication. Body language, of course, can only apply to people who are communicating face-to-face -face or also like over Zoom. It is worthwhile to not only hear and be able to listen to spoken words, but also to see and observe a person sharing a message. It is most likely to able to add to one's overall understanding of the message. So here's an example of nonverbal communication. 
and I'm going to kind of click on it because it's a, this is kind of a little mini video here, if I can get it to work. Oh, PowerPoint, PowerPoint. Hang on. Ah, she's doing what's known as the chef's kiss thing. Ah, hang on a second. Let me see if I can get it to work. Oh, picture tools. It's not just a picture that it's a little tiny video and she kind of goes Mwah, and uh, gestures with her hands, right? And everybody knows that's kind of like, oh, this was this was wonderful. This was perfect, right? It kind of started with talking about food, but I find lately it's kind of become sort of a synonym for anything that you thought was wonderful or perfect, right? Here's another example of body language. This guy's got his hand like on his forehead. It's a very typical symbol of like, oh, I'm confused or I'm frustrated, right? You're holding your head. You're so upset. Our body language can reveal a lot about us as we communicate in person with others, and we can gain a lot about others in the same regard. For example, if you are being interviewed for a job and you fail to make eye contact with the interviewers, it would suggest that you're either really nervous or really shy, or perhaps you're not serious about your intentions. It can look sneaky to some people, right? Perhaps you're not able to sit still and stay composed while speaking and listening. It could also indicate a lack of self-confidence, which in turn could result in an unsuccessful interview. On the other hand, if you are able to make good eye contact and show good posture during a job interview, it shows self-confidence and an interviewer would assume that you are serious about things and have prepared for the discussion. So one of the most useful things I ever did when I was in my 20s, I belonged to like a job hunting group when I was looking for work at one point. And one of the things they had us do was go through a mock interview and they videotaped us. And then we had to watch the videotape afterwards. And it was obviously really painful to watch yourself on screen, screen, but it made you really conscious of your body language and your body gestures. And I hadn't realized how some of the things that I was doing, how they would look on the outside. Like I was feeling very nervous. So my, my shoulders were all hunched up around my ears and I kind of was pulling my sleeves down. And the next time I went to a job interview, I corrected for those things. I remembered, hey, this is how you look when you do this, so don't do this. And I remember that there was one other guy too, and he was really, really nervous. And he kept like sort of giggling nervously throughout the interviewer. He was a really nice guy, but he came off a little bit creepy because he was giggling. It came off like, I don't know, a little bit strange. And again, he was kind of shocked when he saw it. So if you get a chance, if you're going to a lot of job interviews right now, get a friend to kind of walk you through one and then take a look at how you look, how you walk in, how you shake their hands, how you sit there. It can be surprising to see yourself through somebody's eyes, but it's also really useful because then you can correct for it. Because sometimes the message you're sending and how you actually feel may be different. Or more importantly, yeah, maybe you are really nervous about the job interview, but that isn't the message you want to send at a job interview. You want to show confidence. And, you know, it, confidence can be imitated through body language, so it's worthwhile learning that. Okay, effective communication. Your chances of getting that special job would definitely be better with appropriate body language. Therefore, in this and other similar situations, being able to effectively communicate both verbally and non-verbally is key to personal success. In, fo in fact, most employers rank a person's ability to speak while maintaining good body language at the top of their list when it comes to hiring and keeping employees. Effective communication in the workplace is very important for ensuring success overall, along with promoting good relationships among your coworkers. Ineffective communication in the workplace among coworkers and supervisors can cause costly errors through misunderstandings and will not be good for a business. Okay, so here's an example of a dad and a child on the floor. The dad is working on the computer and the child is playing near him. It says, technology allows increasing numbers of employees to work at home and telecommute to the office. As a result, more and more messages, especially memos, needed to be written to keep the lines of communication open between remote employees and the office. Technology. When a person is engaged in a telephone conversation or tuned into a radio broadcast like our class, 
body language does not play any kind of role in communication because it's not face-to-face -face contact. Now I want to point out it would depend on like some some of these kind of Zoom phone calls the person or the teacher is showing their face. I'm not choosing to because I want you to focus on the content, not on me. So you're not having face-to-face -face contact, but it depends on the, the, uh, the context, right? The emphasis therefore is on the spoken words alone, or in other words, just the verbal communication. One does not have the opportunity to observe another's level of eye contact, facial expressions, gestures, and posture. However, you do get to listen to things like volume, uh, pauses, uh, emotional expression, expression being used to uh, emphasize punctuation, all those kind of things can, are also a part of oral verbal communication, even in this class, right? Okay, three main levels or main types of communication. Um, there's internal, interpersonal, and mediated. Internal communication refers to communication within your own mind, what you are thinking about and making personal decisions. Like let's say um, you've been called into your boss's office and you're not sure what it's about. And so you might be having a, a conversation with yourself about it. Like, oh my gosh, is this, could it be about, you know, the conflict I had with so-and-so the other day? Did they get upset? Did they report it? Or, or you know, there, I know there's that new sales contract coming up. Could it be that I'm going to get that new sales contract? And you're kind of talking to yourself about it. That's internal communication. Interpersonal communication refers to communication between two people or among more than two people. So let's say if you got to that office and then sat down and had the conversation with the boss, that would be interpersonal communication. So between two people. Um, another example would be having a conversation in person with a family member or having that same conversation um, with a telephone with a friend. Um, another great example would be participation at a meeting with coworkers. And that would include, well, no, actually, actually that's going to be the next type. Hang on a second. I'm going to move on to my next slide here. During a meeting, both verbal and nonverbal communication skills are demonstrated by participants, and that can make or break desired outcomes. I feel like that's a little dramatic, but you know what they're trying to say. A third level of communication is mediated communication, okay, which essentially just means communications that's going through a type of media. Those can be messages that are shared through an inanimate or electronic means, such as radio, television, internet, or Zoom. We all know the influence these channels of communication are having on our daily lives. They're also known as mass media. It's not always mass media, though it can be like a smaller media, like a, an office meeting could be held through Zoom or something, right? meaning they're able to reach many people at the same time with messages of all kinds, informative and entertaining, some positive and some negative. So anytime you're using media, it kind of is, it can be anyways, a little bit of a barrier to communication because maybe you're seeing the top half of their body, but you're not seeing all of their body. So you're not necessarily getting all the information, right? They may be editing things. They may be... Um, there's just different things that are occurring the moment you're using media that can kind of alter the level of communication, right? Okay, so the culminating activity is about researching and analyzing uh, business forms of communication, okay? And this is worth 50 marks. It's kind of a lot of little things that add up, okay? As you've seen in this unit, being able to produce forms of communication for use in the workplace is important. You've had the opportunity to create some samples of the various forms, including letters, memos, emails, proposal report. With this culminating activity, you're going to shift gears, so to speak, and be given the opportunity to do a little research and analysis. So you're going to find samples of the following communication forms, and you're going to analyze these forms using PAYBOC, which stands for Purpose, Audience, Information, Benefits, Objections, context, and that's kind of an overall model or a, a method of being able to analyze and write uh, different forms of communication. So I'm going to go into those sort of briefly and then a little more thoroughly, okay? Purpose is your intended result, an answer to the question why. Like, why are you writing this? That's your purpose. A audience is a person or the people who will be listening to 
reading or viewing a presentation or performance. Remember that when we had that video, we talked about your intended audience, but also your unknown and unintended audience because information could be getting passed forward to other people that you're not aware of and weren't necessarily thinking of when you did it. Uh, information, facts and knowledge obtained from investigation, study or instruction. B for benefits, things which are helpful, favorable, or profitable. O is for objections, feelings, or not just feelings of disapproval or opposition, but facts as well. Um, C, context, the timing or circumstance under which an event occurs. Okay, so we're going to be using this method more thoroughly to do our analysis. So here's your assignment. You're going to gather two business letters. We're going to analyze one. You're going to gather two memos. We're going to analyze one of them. And then you're going to gather one instruction manual. We don't have to do anything to that. So the following are suggestions of places to check for your samples. Remember that you don't want to just like take things without permission, right? Obviously, you need to speak with staff in a certain location to attain a sample of the communication forms with permission to use them for this purpose. That would stand even for your own workplace, right? You don't want to get in trouble because you've shared a memo that wasn't intended to be shared. You can always just kind of go to your boss and say, hey, I'm doing this course and I need a memo. Would this memo be okay to use for the purposes of this course, right? Um, should you have any difficulty obtaining them from workplaces around your community due to confidentiality, you can always use the internet, right? But it's kind of more useful to do ones that um, have more immediate impact that you've actually seen and used. Please, so please try and do your best to get actual workplace samples. Sometimes the one way that might make it more acceptable is like um, if it was like a memo to so-and-so from so-and-so, if you erased um, or whited out or covered up with a black marker the names or say any pertinent financial information, that kind of thing, maybe it'd be more acceptable to your boss to use it. Anyways, just something to think about, but we do need it for this assignment one instruction manual. Now for this portion, you don't need to do any kind of analysis. You simply need to get one sample of an instruction manual of some type and submit it. Some examples could be things like a photocopier manual, a laminating manual, computer or laptop manual, printer manual, any other business machine manual, safe, sorry, staff information manual, health and safety manual, or any other instruction manual at the office. Again, not just the cover, but the actual whole manual. So just for you know easiness sake, I would suggest getting a smaller manual rather than a bigger manual. Um, and again, ask permission if it's a work one to make sure it's okay for that, for you to use it for this. So you also have to gather two possible business letters. Some examples might include things like a job offer, a complaint to a supplier, a letter on some sort of upcoming business change, a letter of an apology, a termination letter, in other words, a letter about firing, contract renewal letter, a sales quote letter, moving letter, collection notice, or any other type of letter that is a business letter. You're also going to gather two possible memos. Memos are generally shorter and they're generally targeted internally towards other members of the business. Memos might not be on paper these days. Memos might be sent through an email and that's fine. Okay, uh, you can take a screenshot or you can print it out. Again, if it's from your work, make sure you've got your boss's permission to use it. You don't want to have any other problems with it, right? Um, it might be a memo about upcoming holidays, notice of management changes, uh, scheduling some sort of upcoming training, announcing staff events, announcing a policy change of some sort, some sort of housekeeping information, health and safety issues, dress code issues, new product information, whatever might get sent. And it's not like a personal email, like not something just your boss sent just to you, but something that got sent to say everybody in the office or everybody in one department, that kind of thing, right? All right, possible places. Uh, if possible, it would be good if you can get your samples from two different sources. So it doesn't have to be just your business, things like the nursing station, a learning center, the school, the band office, the internet, the store, the airport, any other place of employment in your community, right? Like you, again, you go in and you kind of say, hey, 
do you have any business letters I could use as a sample because I'm doing this course and I need it. I'm not asking for anything confidential. Um, a lot of places will be happy to share that kind of thing because they want to encourage people to finish their schooling. And if anybody doesn't want to, just say, you know, thank you for your time. I appreciate your listening. And you kind of move on to the next place, okay? Um, copies plus the analysis. So you're to submit all five copies. That's the two business letters, the two memos, and the instruction manual, along with the two analyses for me to mark. And each analysis will be in a paragraph format consisting of at least six sentences. Although it is recommended that you write a rough draft or a rough copy for each analysis, you only need to submit the final copy. So I want you to do a rough copy for your own benefit, but only give me the final copy, okay? Okay, so now I'm gonna go through how to use the Payback format in more detail, and we're gonna kind of do a demo one so you can kind of see how it works, okay? So P is purpose. That means the purpose for initiating the communication or writing this particular document. For example, if the credit card division of a bank decides to send a formal email to its credit card holders to make them understand the policy of a moratorium period during the COVID-19 pandemic. Moratorium means a policy when they weren't demanding um, that things be paid because a lot of people were out of work during the pandemic. So in this case, the purpose of the communication is to educate its customers on the responsible use of credit cards uh, to use debt responsible, responsibly. Uh, the purpose of another letter might be to inform customers of an upcoming sale or a memo to let employees know about a new software system being installed with training bead provided on Friday. Sorry, there we go. Okay, and then we look at A, the audience. Who is the target audience or the recipient of the communication? Having an insight into the target audience is cardinal. In other words, like it's the first thing for the success of communication. For example, the target audience of communication via email in this previous example was the credit card holders. The target audience is gonna change depending on the purpose of the communication. It might be all the staff or just the staff from one department. It could be sent to a supply company or an IT company the business deals with. It might be all clients and customers or maybe just a section of them such as parents buying school supplies. All right, uh, I for information. What information the message should contain? Um, what is being shared is gonna rely on the audience, right? What, what information you might send to your employees about an upcoming sale might uh, be very different than the kind of information that you might send to your customers, right? The one to your employees might include things like sales targets, um, information on uh, returns, information on who's gonna be working that day, on shifts, whatever. A lot of that kind of thing might not be shared to the customers. The customers might get more of the information about, you know, hey, look, it's the winter stuff, and hey, look, it's this, right? It's not gonna be the same thing because the audience has different responsibilities and different interests. If the audience is not aware, then they need to be familiarized with facts. For example, the email that would involve information about the relaxation period provided during the moratorium period might also include consequences of irresponsible use of credit, ways to manage credit and debt, and reasonable expectations of the use of credit. Okay. And then benefits. What benefit does the sender and the receiver derive from the exchange of communication? In other words, how does this help the sender and how does this help the receiver, right? Assessing how much interest they need to pay on the credit taken or how much interest customers will have to pay during and after the moratorium period might have been included in the bank's letter. In that case, the bank is making sure that the customers are aware of the relaxation period, but also the time limit in which they have to pay the bill. That benefits the customer who then can plan their finances better, especially during, again, like the thing with COVID, right? And it also benefits the bank who then is more likely to get their money, which is what they want. O, o stands for objections. Objections can be like um, things the receiver might be upset by or object to or disagree with. And you often are discussing those basically in order to overcome or discuss the objections in a tactful way. So for example, credit card holders can raise requests to extend the moratorium period in order to pay less interest on a credit card. And this section attempts to predict possible objections about information 
contained in the letter, you might need to be able to put yourself in the customer's or the employee's shoes and think about what might bother them. And then you address those issues um, and attempt to win the receiver over to the new idea procedure. So it kind of um, makes your communication more effective in the first place. And it saves you a bunch of time because you're not getting, you know, 20 employees saying, but what about blah, 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 right? Because you've already addressed that issue and they already know what you're planning to do about that particular situation. So for example, if your business is now open in a, uh, an hour later each day, full-time employees may be worried about having to work more hours for the exact same pay. And the company could address this concern by issuing a statement that the majority of those extra hours are gonna be going to student workers or part-time workers who are being paid on an hourly rate and they might welcome the extra hours and the extra pay. So people who are on salary aren't like, oh, all of a sudden I'm working more and I'm not getting any more money. You're, you're answering those objections before they even get um, said, essentially. And then C, C stands for context, which is talking about the relationship with the receiver. You can also talk about uh, morale in the, in the organization, the economy, the time of year, anything special about the timing or the circumstances surrounding this particular letter, email, memo, right? Um, a formal email can exchange important information with the customers, and then they're going to be more aware of the payment policy and procedure. So, for example, during COVID, many laws changed regarding the payment of bills. What was due, what couldn't be, um, what penalties couldn't be applied, that kind of thing, right? And that new context would have resulted in policy and procedural changes in many businesses. And businesses might have sent those um, that information out either to employees or to customers, either in a letter or a letter memo format. Okay. So here is a sample business letter. And here is my sample analysis using that payback acronym, okay? So I'm just gonna kind of go through the acronym like just in order and try and answer each question. Sometimes it might take me more than one sentence Sometimes it might only take me one sentence. Oh, I can see I had a, I had a problem with one of the things and I kind of left it and we'll have to tackle it together. Okay, so P for purpose. The purpose, oh, I should read the business letter first. Date, address, dear Mr. XYZ. Enclosed is the report estimating our power consumption for the year as requested by John Brennan, Vice President on September 4th. The report is the result of several meetings with Jamie Anson, Manager of Plant Operations, and her staff in an extensive survey of all our employees. The survey was delayed by the transfer of key staff in building A. We believe, however, that the report will provide the information you need to furnish us with a cost estimate for the installation of your Mark II energy saving system. We would like to thank Billy Budd of ESI for his assistance in preparing the survey. If you need more information, please let me know. Sincerely, ABC, new projects office, email ID. Okay, so the purpose of this business letter is to provide a report on the company's, um, hang on, I'm gonna rephrase that, uh, company's power consumption and how the estimate was put together. The audience for this report was Mr. XYZ, whoever that is, and presumably John Brennan, the vice president of the company, okay? Because he's the one who requested those. Information that should be in this letter is who was consulted, how they arrived at the estimate, who to contact for more information. I wrote the final cost. It isn't actually included in the letter, but I think there's supposed to be an enclosure and it's in that to me. The benefit of this letter for the vice president is that he needed this information in order to create a cost estimate for the new projects office. The benefit for the new projects office is that now the vice president will be able to give them a cost estimate for the installation of the Mark II energy saving system. I had a hard time thinking about what objections this might be because it's so, um, such a straightforward type of letter. I couldn't think what the objections might be. So I'm kind of just looking at it now and trying to think objections um, that are addressed. Okay, how about, um, uh, is that, is that addressed? Now, one objection, how about that? One objection that is addressed, because now it's a uh, singular, that is addressed 
is that is an awareness that this estimate is late and explaining the reasons why. Okay. So in case somebody wasn't mad and like, oh, hey, you know, you were supposed to have this blah, blah, blah time ago. Why am I only getting it now? Well, here's the reason because in order to make an effective, um, an effective cost estimate, they had to know who was actually going to be in the building and some bunch of staff were moving. So that changed their estimate. Context is that the new projects office is responsible for overseeing new projects, which presumably this um, installation of Mark II is going to be. And is providing this power estimate for the vice principal, vice principal, vice president, sorry, as a teacher, wrong word there, vice president. So he can then provide an overall, it's kind of flipped off the edge there, installation estimate. All right, move this up. Sorry, sometimes I'm changing from Google to PowerPoint and it's not perfect. And so sometimes things that fit perfectly on one slide don't fit perfectly on the next slide. Okay, here we go. So that's an example doing it with a letter. I don't think I've necessarily done the most amazing job, but this is an example of what you would be doing with one of the business letters. You don't have to do it for both the business letters you collect. You only have to do it for one of the business letters, okay? And then you're doing the exact same thing for a memo. Remember, you're collecting two memos. You only have to do the PayBock analysis for one of the memos. So here is a memo, product launch, launch update for the GHC, sorry, GHY computer, date December 17th, 2020, to all employees from Jason, Jason Saxon, Vice President of Marketing, subject product launch update for the GHY computer. Considering the responses we've received over the past three months from product testers and customer surveys, I am writing to inform you that the product launch for the GHY computer will be delayed from its initial date of January 2nd, 2021 to April 2nd, 2021. We believe that the extra time to test the computer's capability with updated software programs will serve to help the customer in expanding their usage of software to perform daily tasks. Some employees have expressed a belief that this delay will lead to an increase in competitors' sales. So the organization has decided to sell our current computers at a 30% discounted rate up until the computer's launch while offering holiday sales of 50% up through the new year. Sales representatives can share this information with current customers and leads. Leads would be like the people in charge of sales and stuff. The, the marketing department will keep the organization posted on new updates. We understand that this change may affect the revenue and profits generated by the sales team. Managers have the authorization to drop the current sales targets for quarter four and work with representatives on retaining current customers to provide customer service when needed. While this delay is unfortunate news for all of us, we believe in the promise of our employees to rebound from this and thrive during the 2021 fiscal year. We believe our current clients will stay committed to us despite this news. Thank you, Jason Sax Saxon. And then it gives his email address and his phone number if you wanna to talk to him. So we're gonna do a payback analysis of this. And what is the main purpose? Well, he kind of announces his purpose right away in the subject line. And then he again discusses it in his very first paragraph. The purpose of this memo is to announce the product launch for the GHY computer will be delayed from January 2nd, 2021 to April 2nd, 2021. Who is the audience for this memo? The audience is all the employees of the GHY computer company. And that's easy because in memos, they say, right, right away, who's, who's it to? All employees. The information that is in the memo is that after hearing from product tester, testers and customer surveys, they are delaying the product launch in order to expand the usage of the software to perform more daily tasks. So in other words, there were complaints, right? 
people were not necessarily happy. So they're upgrading the product before they try and put it on the floor. There's also a concern that this might cause their competitor's sales to go up. So they're offering a discount on the current computers that are already out there. Because of this, the sales target for the fourth quarter may be dropped. In other words, we know this might affect things. So therefore, because um, a lot of times sales companies have um, a certain target, like you have to make this amount of money or this number of sales. And they're saying, don't worry, we're not going to expect quite so much because we know that this delay might affect our, our sales. The benefits are that the employees know what's going on, so they feel calmer. And the benefit to the owner is that people feel more company loyalty towards him, right? Employees that are feeling anxious that they're going to have to like somehow try and meet the same sales targets while all these um, reduced prices are on are going to be feeling anxious and worried about their jobs, um, knowing that that owner or sorry, the vice president is aware of that and it's gonna take account of it by dropping the sales target, helps them feel calmer, right? Objections might be the concern that their sales will go down or that they will be expected to keep sales targets as high as normal, even, even though um, prices are reduced, sorry. Prices are reduced, okay? Now, you don't have to only use one sentence for each one. Like for the information part, I had to use several sentences. So, but because there are six letters, at the very least, there should be for sure six sentences, okay? Context, in other words, the timing and the circumstance. The owner of the business is reassuring his employees that they will be successful despite the delay in the product launch. Okay. So this is really, he's informing them, but he's also, the tone of this is really trying to reassure people. We believe our current clients will stay with us, right? Um, we know this change may affect revenue. We're going to give managers the authorization to drop the current sales uh, targets. It's not like reassuring the way a parent would reassure a child necessarily, but it's definitely intended to help calm fears from the employees, the way it's written. Okay, I gotta make this a little bit smaller so it fits. There we go, okay. Remember that this is business writing, which is different than the kind of academic writing we've been doing so far. So you do not need to worry about the typical academic paragraph structure that we normally worry about. You don't need to do an opening sentence. You don't need to do a closing sentence. You simply use the Paybach formula to structure your paragraph for these analysis. Remember that you're doing two, one for a business letter, one for a business memo. Okay, the email message. You're gonna send your teacher, me, a brief email message to let me know that you're working on this culminating activity. And then you're to leave a brief voicemail message for me as well with the same information. The email message is worth five marks and the voicemail message on my phone is worth 10 marks. Okay, they're gonna contain the same amount and, and information, right? They, they can be literally exactly the same and that's fine. My advice would be to write out the email message with all the crucial information and then call me and read out the exact same information onto my phone or talk to me directly if I happen to be the one that answers the phone. The message needs to include your name, the course, the name of this assignment, which is unit three culminating activity, and then some sort of information letting me know that you're currently working on or you've just completed the unit three culminating activity. It can be a very brief message. It does not need to be long. I just kind of need to know who you are so I'm able to give you the marks for this part of this assignment. And I wanted to reassure you, you know what? I understand not everybody likes making phone calls, especially to strangers, which for many people I am. I apologize. I know that part is not fun, but you are getting 10 marks for it. So it's probably worth it. Again, it's very short. It probably will take you less than a minute to, to do this phone call. Um, okay. So I wanted to kind of run you through. Here's a sample phone message. You dial the phone number, 807-737-1488. The secretary will probably answer, right? And she'd say, you know, Wasa, what do you need? And you say, oh, I need to be put through to Jillian. Or you can say extension 2211, and then she'll bring you through. If I answer, you just tell me the message. If the phone messaging system answers instead, then you leave the message with it. 
So here is a possible sample message. Hi, Jillian. This is Sarah Ridley here. I am from Frenchman's Head. I am in your English 4E course. I am currently working on the Unit 3 Accommodating Activity. I am leaving this email message as part of that assignment. I should be finished the unit in a couple of days, and I will send it to you when it is completed. I hope you have a good day. And then you can hang up the phone. After you hang up, send me your email with the exact same message and let me know in the email that you've already left that phone message so that I'm looking for it, right? Just in case, especially if you've like called on the weekend, I'll give kind of have a heads up to check on it. Okay, my contact information. To send me the email, you can reach me at jillian.percy at nnec.on.ca. To phone me, you can call 1-800-667-3703, toll free. That's extension 2211. Now, if you want to talk to me directly, my office hours are from 10 o'clock to 1.30 and then 4 o'clock to 6.30 this week, Monday to Thursday, until April 11th. Friday, my hours change. I'll be here from 10 to 5 approximately. Then after that, we are moving into a new term. And new term, I always teach new things, which changes my office hours. So next term, I'm teaching uh, from 6 to 7. And my office hours are going to change to 12 to 7, Monday to Thursday. And then 10 to 5 on Friday until the end of term 2, sorry, 2B two, two at that point. Remember, the end of 2B is when you have to finish this course if you're registered right now. After that, you'd be doing it during the summertime. I won't be here. There will be a marker of some sort. Might even be me. Um, so you're going to try and get this in by kind of the middle of June. You don't want to leave this to the last minute because I'll be marking like crazy at that point. Okay, so here is your grading scheme. The two business letter samples, just the samples, not doing anything with them is worth 10 marks. The two memo samples, again, not doing anything with them is worth 10 marks. One instruction manual, that's worth five marks. Letter analysis, five marks. Memo analysis, five marks. Email to me, five marks. Voicemail to me, 10 marks. And the total marks for the entire, um, all these different little tiny mini assignments is 50 marks. And then at that point, you are then done unit three and you can go on to unit four, which is pretty short. And unit four will be our last unit for the season. Now, activity one was on page four and was a whole bunch of different assignments. That was 83. Activity two was on page 27. And again, a whole bunch of assignments was worth 80. CA stands for the culminating activity. That starts on page 34. And we've just gone through all that. That's worth 50 marks. Overall, this entire unit is worth 213 total marks. So 50 marks is a good chunk of that. And a lot of this, I think, is pretty simple, so it shouldn't be too hard to do. Um, tomorrow, we're going to be working on, um, well, we're going to start unit four, basically. If by any chance you can't get the uh, information off of a local business, Remember that you can go online. Let me just kind of grab it and show you what I mean. Um, I'm using Microsoft searches because it came up first, but I actually find uh, Google is maybe a little bit better. And you would just write something like um, business, sorry, business memo sample. And then a bunch of things would come up. The thing is you want to make sure it actually has real content. Hang on. Okay, and that it's readable. Some of them get kind of blurred out and you might not be able to read it. You also wanna make sure it's long enough that you can actually follow the whole payback formula. If it's too short, especially for like a memo or a business letter, there may not be enough information there. The other thing you gotta be aware of, sometimes it's more like a template and there's just a bunch of like, um, kind of like what they call holder text. It's not really information. Or it might say like, dear so-and-so, and have a lot of spaces for imaginary information. That kind of thing isn't going to work for this. It has to be uh, an actual memo. That's why we're talking about this. Um, and then same thing, business memo sample, business letter sample. One place that I have found really helpful for this kind of stuff. Um, and again, you can, like I said, you can just do this. So here's what I mean. Don't use this. Hang on. Here is, is this, is, uh, let me see if it's really, okay. 
you wouldn't send me something like this because this is essentially it's blank. It's just kind of showing you how to do that kind of template. So you wouldn't send me something like that. Um, hang on. Um, no, no, no. Okay, that's pretty good. You can actually read this. Again, you should be able to read it. So you've got uh, who it's from, you've got a date, you've got who it's going to, you've got a bunch of information. It's fairly long. It should be fairly easy to use that to do the payback formula. So that's the kind of thing you'll do if you can't get um, a sample from work or from the workplaces around your community, but it really is better to use kind of local stuff. For one thing, it makes things more unique, right? I wouldn't want everybody to grab this particular sample letter. That would be kind of uh, kind of strange to be marking 10,000 of the exact same type. And I, I'm sure this should be fairly obvious, but obviously you can't use the ones that I used for my sample to do yours, right? Those are off limits because I just did one. You can't just kind of write what I wrote and hand it in and expect me to give the marks. I know like 99% of the people would not even think of that, but every now and again, I get that kind of thing. Okay. Um, I think we're doing pretty good. I, there's no real point in going on because that's the end of the unit. Um, does anyone, is there anyone even with me? Okay. I was going to say, does anyone have any questions? But I don't have anybody on with me today. So I think that's more or less it. If you are having any kind of issues with the assignments or you're struggling by all means, give me a phone call. Let me know. I am happy to help. The other thing I can also do, sometimes people are like not sure if they've done an assignment correctly. Send it on to me and say, hey, I'm concerned about this. What do you think? Has, have I done it correctly? And I'd be happy to mark it or give you commentary and say, yep, here's this, here's that. And then you can always send it back to me and I can, um, I can upgrade marks, right? Keep in mind, I can always upgrade marks if you want to redo an assignment. All right. And yep, tomorrow's unit four. And thank you for joining me. And I will see you during the next class. Thank you so much.